go. Part three, perception. Let's go. <clears throat> so here's some fun stuff. Oh my gosh, we've already seen this before. But today, we're talking about this. Okay? So, perception. Perception is the process of integrating, organizing, and interpreting sensations. How do you interpret the raw data sensation? All right, genetics and environment shape this differently for each and every single one of us. So, yeah. I mean, how do we interpret this data? I mean, obviously, this is a picture. It has color, and light waves are hitting the back of your eye. We know that, right? But what can we actually infer, right? What can we do? How can we integrate, organize, and interpret these sensations into something meaningful here? You know? It's obviously Christmas time. You know, I, and that's because I grew up in a culture that celebrates Christmas. So, boom, black cat, seen it before, bangs. I mean, it's weird. It's like, how am I doing that? How am I picking this out and perceptually, you know, do I take that for granted? Yeah. That I can do that? 100%. But it's all life experience. Genetics and environment put together and how we interpret this data. All right, let's talk about two different levels of processing. So we have bottom-up processing. This is information-based processing. All right, it emphasizes the importance of the sensory receptors in detecting the basic features of the stimulus in the process of recognizing a whole pattern. So you actually come up from the bottom. You look at the features first. That's what bottom-up processing is. Size, color, shape, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff would be how you build from the bottom up, right? It's a bottom up process. It's noticing this flower, all right, in the middle of a field because it's different. It's yellow, it's taller, it's shaped differently. <clears throat> so bottom up processing is the result of a percept, is the resulting percept is determined by the stimulus features. So top down processing. This is what we do on a regular basis because we've been alive and experienced the world. Top-down processing um, emphasizes the importance of the observer's knowledge, expectations, and other cognitive processes in arriving at meaningful perceptions. Analysis that moves from the whole to the parts, it's also called conceptually driven processing. Many of our perceptions are driven by top-down processing because of our past experiences, memories, knowledge, cultural background. So, for example, your dog has been lost for three days and you cannot stop thinking about the dog. When you hear a dog bark, you assume that it's your dog. That's what you do. Okay, you're working from a theme, right? Top down. Whenever I use top down processing, I say the cat. If I was using the bottom, down, bottom up processing, I would look at each one of these features by themselves, okay? And I would, I would be, I would say this is obvious, this is an H. And that's an H, so who knows what it says. Uh, so even though the second letter in each word is ambiguous, top-down processing allows for easy disambiguation because of the context. Now obviously ambiguous means vague. Can perception occur without sensation? Um, there are studies of this stuff. Um, a lot of psychologists probably say no, but they don't discredit it you know, extrasensory perception. So ESP, extrasensory perception, means the detection of information by some means other than through the normal processes of sensation. Recent surveys conducted by the Associated Press um, and the Gallup poll say that 50% of American adults believe in ESP, including telepathy and clairvoyance. So let's talk about those. What is telepathy? Direct communication between the minds of two individuals. Haven't seen that happen yet. Clairvoyance, the perception of a remote object or event, such as sensing that a friend has been injured in a car accident. Your mom probably has a story about this or something like that. You know, like, I felt this happen. I woke up and I had a call, a missed call from Susan, our aunt, and she said this happened and Greg got in a car accident in California. Psychokinesis, also known as telekinesis, the ability to influence a physical object, process, or event, such as bending a key or stopping a clock without touching it. If you've seen The Matrix, 
You know, it's that kid who bends the spoon. I've yet to see this happen as well. Um, and then precognition, the ability to predict future events. Isn't that what we do as humans anyways? Isn't that the name of the game? Don't I want to be really good at predicting future events, whether it be three seconds from now or five years from now? Um, but I think this is taking it one step farther, and it has to do with events that are, you know, it's almost like a Nostradamus thing, if you know who he is. You know, he, he made over 3,000 predictions, and uh, some of them come true. So, uh, keep an open mind, but trust scientific skepticism. That is the main thing right here, scientific skepticism. That's what a critical thinker would do. Studying this is called parapsychology. Scientific investigation of claims of paranoia, paranoia, paranormal phenomenon. So here's bottom-up processing and top-down processing in one place. Bottom-up is working from, honestly, what could be even further down this would be letters, right? Letters, words, phrases, ideas, main ideas and themes. Bottom-up is working from the parts to the whole. And then top-down is working from the whole to the parts. Okay. Gestalt psychology, um, a school of psychology founded in Germany uh, in the early 1900s. It's kind of uh, one of those things that, just like structuralism or functionalism, it's, no really, it's not really studied anymore. It's kind of uh, used um, for illusions and stuff like that. Um, so, 1900s, uh, maintain that our sensations are actively processed according to consistent perceptual rules that results in meaningful whole perceptions or gestalts. Whole perceptions, gestalts, interchangeable. Max Wertheimer, uh, he's always arguing or argued that the whole is greater than the sum of his parts. When you look at me, you see me as a whole person. You don't look at me and say beard, eyes, nose, hair, ears. You don't put me together by my parts. You look at me and you assume that I am a whole person, right? Um, so, the, the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. As a human, we see the whole, not the parts. That's what Gestalt is saying. Uh, all right, the perception of shape. So looking around your world, you don't see random edges, curves, colors, or splotches of light and dark. Rather, you see countless distinct objects against a variety of backgrounds. This is a Gestalt principle right here, okay? Figure ground relationship. You usually see the figure first. The figure is the most dominant thing, and then you see the background, if you see the background at all. So a Gestalt principle of perceptual organization that states that we automatically separate the elements of perception into the feature that is clearly standing out, the figure, and its less distinct background, the ground. People tend to notice the shape of the figure and not the background. So here we see um, arrows, right? Or do you see the people walking downstairs? Huh. Or maybe here. Do you see a chalice or a vase or a, you know, candle holder, whatever you want to call it? Or do you see two people kissing or about to kiss? Their noses are about to touch, right? So we see this as being the shape, the figure. All right, but the background, there's something there. All right, the background, it looks like two people's noses are about to touch. We see the figure first. Perceptual grouping is pretty easy. Um, so there's different laws of how we group things together. The law of similarity, the tendency to perceive objects of a similar size, shape, or color as a unit or figure. All right, uh, thus you perceive four horizontal rows uh, rather than six vertical columns of holiday cookies up here, right? You group these, right, in rows, not columns, because it makes more sense that way. It's easier that way. The law of closure is the tendency to fill in gaps um, in an incomplete image. Uh, thus you perceive the curved lines on a clock as smooth, continuous circles, even though they are interrupted by workers in clock's hands. You know that these things will continue. You can close it off, the law of closure. If I showed you angles right now, right, 
And at one angle was, uh, I don't even know, this is going to be hard to show, show you. Um, you'd close it off, right? If I just showed you a, an angle that was, uh, hmm. I don't know if I can do it. Hold on. I can't do it until later. Um, all right, so law of closure, you close things off. You can make things and assume things will be a certain shape even though they're not. The law of good continuation or the law of continuation. This is a tendency to group elements that appear to follow the same direction as a single unit or figure. Thus, if you tend, you tend to see the curved sections of the highways as continuous units. Um, the law of good continuation is pretty much this. If it's traveling together, they must be grouped together, right? If it's looking like they are continuing together, right? They're moving together, then okay, they're probably grouped together. The law of proximity uh, is the tendency to perceive objects that are close to one another as a single unit. Thus, you perceive these five people right here as one group of two people and one group of three people. So we have this group and this group. But we don't know that for sure, do we? But our minds, right, uh, our, our perceptual tools that we have say these two people are together and these three people are together. And then the law of prognosis, which is also called the law of simplicity. Now, the law of simplicity states when several perceptual organizations of assortment of a visual element are possible, the perceptual interpretation that occurs will be the one that is producing the best Simplest, most stable shape. So you probably perceive this image as three overlapping squares, right? But they're not. They're not three overlapping squares. Okay? This is a square. This is a six-sided shape. And this is a six-sided shape. But we perceive them in this most simple form, which would be three overlapping squares. All right, depth perception. Um, so how we perceive depth in the world, which is really important for a human. Perception of distance and motion helps us gauge the position of stationary objects uh, and predict the path of moving objects. Depth perception is the use of visual cues to perceive the distance uh, of three-dimensional characteristics of an object. So what can we do with one eye? So this is what our depth perception skills are with one eye, our uh, abilities. Um, Relative size. If two or more objects are assumed to be similar in size, the object that appears larger is perceived as being closer. Okay, if there were two of me right here, and one of them looked larger, you would assume that the larger one would be closer to you, because that's how it works, because we're similar in size. Overlap. When one object partially blocks or obscures the view of another object, the partially blocked object is perceived as being farther away. This cue is also called interposition. All right? What's closer? Me or the yardstick? The yardstick, because it's in front of me. It's overlapping me, meaning it has to be in front of me. All right? These are just perceptual tools that we use without even thinking about them to perceive the world. Aerial perspective. Faraway objects often per appear hazy or slightly blurred by the atmosphere. Texture gradient would be the same as, um, you know, texture gradient is this. The farther away something is, the less detailed it is, right? So imagine I'm standing on a football field and I look directly down at my feet. I can see blades of grass. The detail is there. Now you look out 30 yards and you're not going to be able to see the blades of grass 30 yards away. You're going to be able to see a giant splotch of green. Uh, linear perspective, parallel lines seem to meet in the distance. This is that classic looking down the road thing, like a straight road or railroad tracks. If you look down the, the, you know, those, the, the straight line of the railroad tracks, they look like they're going to meet. Those two lines on each side looks like it's going to meet farther along. I'll show you an example of it here in a second. Motion parallax, when you're moving, uh, you use the speed of passing objects to estimate the distance of objects. Nearby objects seem to zip by um, faster than distant objects do. Um, think about this. You're riding in your car, right? You're in the back seat, mom, dad, whoever's driving. 
Um, you look out the window and you're driving down like I-40. So you see this sign maybe, right? An exit sign, exit 414, Castle Lane. Driving by exit 414. You look at that sign and it whizzes past you, right? But then you also see an airplane in the sky. And it's far away from you. And it looks like, or it seems like, the car is traveling faster than the airplane um, because the airplane's so far away, it's so distant that it's moving slower. So closer things whiz by, slower or farther away things are slower. Okay, these are things you do unconsciously to judge perception, depth. And then accommodation uh, utilizes information about the changing shape of your lens. Your brain has gotten so good at seeing that when your lens changes shape to accommodate new light to the back of your retina, your brain understands that your lens did just change shape and that things might be getting closer or things might be getting farther away. You've been doing it your whole life. Your brain knows what's going on when your lens changes shape. That's called accommodation. So uh, here's linear perspective. This is what it looks like. So obviously these two lines are the same length, but they, this one looks uh, larger because it is farther along on the tracks. As you can see, these tracks parallel uh, end up looking like they're going to touch uh, farther along. That's what linear perspective is. All right, binocular cues. We got um, you know, using two eyes, that's what binocular means. Uh, so convergence, the degree to which muscles rotate your eyes to focus on an object. The closer an object is, the more your eyes converge on that object, right? I mean, I bring my finger here, and I'm going to go cross-eyed. Um, the farther away it gets, the farther, uh, you know, my eyes get a little bit wider apart. Um, your brain makes sense of that information unconsciously to know and gauge distance. And then we have binocular disparity. Because our eyes are set a couple of inches apart, uh, slightly different images are produced on each eye. Um, you know, you can do this, you can pick an image out right now, uh, make a, a hole in your hand, as you can see here, uh, and like I'll do the camera. I'm opening both eyes right now, I'm going to close my right eye, and the camera moves. I no longer see the camera in the hole. I open the eye again, there's the camera. Okay, close my left eye, the camera's still there. That means I'm right eye dominant. I have two different images coming in, right? But one of them is a little bit more dominant than the other. Um, so, binocular disparity, okay? Um, whenever the image is different on both uh, eyes, our brain makes sense of that as being close. Whatever it is, that thing is close. Uh, this is a stereogram. These things are so hard for me to do. Um, perception of motion. Um, we'll look at this here in a second. But we have induced motion. It's an illusion of visual perception in which a stationary or moving object appears to move or move differently because of other moving objects nearby in the visual field. It is interpreted in terms of uh, the change in the location of the object due to the movement in the space around it. Um, check it out if you want to. There's a video that goes along with it. Uh, stroboscopic motion is basically having a strobe light. You know, the illusion of motion due to a strobe light. The wagon wheel effect is another example of that. Check out the video if you'd like. Perceptual uh, consistency. Um, so, perceptual constancy. The tendency to perceive objects, especially familiar objects, is constant and unchanging despite changes in sensory input. Um, when a door closes, you can definitely tell that it has changed visually, right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily look like the door did, but we keep it the same um, because we know what a door is using perception. Uh, so size constancy, size constancy or consistency uh, the perception of an object as maintaining the same size despite changing images in the retina. And then shape cons uh, constancy or consistency. Uh, the perception of a familiar object as maintaining the same shape regardless of the image produced by the retina. Uh, perceptual illusions. We have the, the Mueller liar illusion. Uh, which line is longer? This one or that one? They're both the same. 
This one looks shorter because these arrows, right, are enclosed, and this these arrows are open. Uh, this is crazy. You see this in real life all the time. You don't even understand it. And then the moon illusion. Check this out. The moon is the same size all the way throughout the entire sky. When it's on the horizon, you're like, dang, that moon is big, son. Now it's the same size as it is up there. You just have more reference points of how big it really is whenever it's near the horizon. Oh, it's near the trees, it's near the building, it's near whatever. It's near the horizon. I mean, look, the moon looks big whenever it's close to the water. And it looks small when it's up above, but it's the same size all the way throughout the entire night. And if you don't believe me, I'm sorry. Here's the Mueller uh, liar illusion in real life right here. So obviously, same size line right here, which just happens to be part of the window. Um, but this one looks taller because, again, the lines are protruding outwards and not inwards. Uh, the effects of experience on perceptual interpretations are ed our education, cultural, and life experiences shape what we perceive. Learning experiences can vary not just from person to person, but also from culture to culture. Perception can be influenced by an individual's expectations, motives, and interests. A perceptual set, the tendency to perceive objects or situations from a particular frame of reference. We look at this face. I mean, look at the curse of, of life, all right? Um, I think this is a Mary Magdalene toast. This is the Jesus pierogi. There's a wolf on this horse. This is A, B, C, or 12, 13, 14. Look at Nessie. Nessie the Loch Ness Monster. No. Uh-uh. Look at these spaceships. No, they're just clouds. All right, let's see how much time I have left. Let's see if I can get some of these illusions. Oh, yeah, let's go. So there we go. Let's do some illusions. Oh, B, home by 513, or 13. E, home. 13Y, 5B. Okay, here we go. Repeat these words. Folk, soak, joke. What is a white part of an egg called? No, it's not yolk. It's called the egg white or the album. Hmm, that's called priming. I primed you to say that, right? I gave you yellow, uh, and then folk, soak, joke, all rhyming with yoke. What's the white part of an egg called? Come on. Uh, do you see a musician or a girl's face? Uh, look at this. We got uh, a face, a face, a face, a face. Look at this old man. Oh my gosh, look at this chicken, this rabbit, this dog, this cat, and this rat. Oh, what is it? Wait a second. That old man and that rat are the same. Again, you were primed. These lines are parallel. I promise you that. Look at that. Boom. Parallel line. Boom. Parallel line. Doesn't look that way, though, does it? Um, oh, read these out loud. Paris in the 